Hi, I'm Michael. Welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about E.T., The Extraterrestrial, the 1982 film written by Melissa Matheson, directed by Steven Spielberg. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetos. Hi. So we are kicking off our fall favorites season, which is very exciting. So this season, what we are doing is we're going to talk about some of the movies that we've each put on our top 10 favorites lists. So we've done episodes on our top 10 favorite movies of the 70s and 80s and 90s and aughts, etc. And so uh, we've each chosen two from those lists. And, you know, some of them are, are classics that maybe the rest of us, like, wanted to see but never got a chance to check out. Some of them are movies that we never wanted to see but are going to have to be. Some, <laughs> some of the time it's going to be both. Uh, but so we've each chosen two movies from our favorites lists. And over the next eight weeks, we're going to be going through them, starting today with E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which was chosen by Trisha. So, Trisha, why don't you tell us a little bit about E.T. Gosh, I love E.T. Um, E.T. is one of my favorite movies ever. It really influenced me and the way that I think about storytelling, the way that I think about filmmaking. Um, it, it's quite possibly my first Spielberg and, um, you know, is one of the most beloved and critically acclaimed films of all time by most people. And... Um, <laughs> no, it's that felt pointed. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a classic. Um, it's a really interesting approach to a movie, right? It's kind of a high concept sci fi movie in some ways, but at its heart, it's this coming of age sort of family drama. Um, and it's really the story of like a friendship, or or almost like has a love story structure to it in some ways. Um, it kind of has these like fable, fantastical, magical elements in it like it's definitely not hard sci-fi it's just like kind of this imaginative um story and the writing is just beautiful like uh long ago i i pitched a a video to michael about like symbolism and imagery in film uh and et is just full of it there are whole stretches of it that are wordless uh we can get into it um that are just relying on the the cinematic um, like language and yeah, symbolism and these things uh, to really convey what's going on. And yeah, it's just emotional. It's beautiful. It taps into childhood things. And I can't wait to talk about it with you guys. Thanks. Yeah, I I didn't remember the there's there's a section where I believe the mom is reading the Peter Pan story mm -hmm. to the and I feel like that was a really important like key yes. part of understanding kind of what this movie is going for the feel it's trying to create the kind of wonder of this sort of childhood world in which you don't see adults faces for like the first hour of mm -hmm. the movie. Like it's very pointedly trying to inhabit the world and imagination of like children. And so, yeah, it was interesting revisiting it after having been resistant to the idea, resistant being a soft word for how I felt, <laughs> uh, and yeah, having forgotten so many of those things, I also just rewatched Stranger Things recently and yeah. realized, oh, 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 this yes. is this. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, ah, just okay. from here. Yeah. Uh, borrowed. Um, yeah. Aggressively. Uh, so, yeah. So I like appreciated all these things that I didn't even, I think, consciously know or remember were part of the tapestry of this movie. It's still the 80s. It still looks super 80s. I have problems with 80s aesthetics. I feel like this movie is, isn't is for me and probably never will be for me. And we can get into some of that if we if we want. But it was just fascinating to, to see what it actually is versus like my childhood memory of it, which was just kind of like, there's the Tootsie Roll alien and Drew Barrymore is screaming. <laughs> And there's scientists like walking through like a big tube into the house for some reason. And then each goes space home. suits and space <laughs> like, suits. And actual yeah. NASA. Space yeah. Suits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Honestly, this was like even weirder than I remembered it. Being. Sure. It's pretty and weird. It's, <laughs> it's very weird. Like kind of insane and unhinged in so many ways. Um, but it's interesting. And we'll we'll get into it more 
as we go on. Alex, what are your thoughts on E.T.? I'm surprised, Michael. I thought we were, we were going to hear about trauma because <laughs> I have some childhood trauma from this movie. And maybe mm. I was projecting onto you. But this movie, I did watch, I think, multiple times as a kid. I have very strong sense memories from it. And I mean, I, I think I liked it in the kid way where you kind of just like all movies. Um, but I was disturbed by it. And it, and really, mostly the the E.T. is dying part of the movie, <laughs> which mm-hmm. we can get into. But the movie does function so much as a children's film for a lot of its runtime. It is still kind of doing a little bit horror jump scare stuff early on with the establishing of the alien. But there's such this childlike wonder, as we're saying, like running through it, that it feels like, oh, this is for kids. And then E.T. is found like in a ditch, like turning like the color of like raw meat with like a raccoon next to it. <laughs> it's like dying. Yeah. And then from there on, like my kid brain was like, oh, God, like this kids movies don't do this. Like <laughs> you don't get into like scary government people now, like all around the dying pale alien. You know, the kid is also dying and screaming. And so it's a really interesting, it's that it's that 80s thing in some ways where kids movies weren't safe. You know, like kids movies were extremely disturbing also. And E.T., for me, that's, that's just my earliest memories of this film were both Spielberg wonder and enjoying it. And then also like some of the most disturbing, chill, chilling me to my core images and moments that I'd seen as, as a young child. <laughs> This is your obligatory 800th reminder that the PG-13 rating did not exist until 1989. (laughs) This is why 80s movies for children were so awful. (laughs) There was no other rating for them. You mean amazing. This is where (laughs) we are. (laughs) So anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much else to say about this movie. But if we're going back to our, like, original relationships with them, I think it didn't become one of my favorites watch over and over infinitely as a child because there was this section of it that disturbed me so deeply <laughs> um and i think yeah it's, just, it's interesting to watch the movie again and i still feel that discordance with the movie where i do think there's something about the 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 leaning towards high hard sci-fi of like a government intervention and what would actually happen if an alien specimen was recovered it's still kind of fantastical and the peter coyote character is kind of very lovely in a lot of ways for being the like ominous government agent, but it, it feels like a different movie being put into the movie about that could almost be read as a child's imagination and imaginary friend, which I know is what Spielberg kind of based the premise on. Um, anyway, we can, we can get in, in, into all of that, but I think that's something that's really interesting to me about this movie is you can kind of read it one way up until a point, And then it does feel very grounded and almost like, once the reality of the alien is acknowledged to the adults, then it becomes a different thing. Yeah, tonally, I feel like I've never seen a movie like this mm. before. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> including Mac and me. <laughs> <laughs> Mac and me. Uh, Brian, what about you? Yeah, definitely a a formative kid movie for me. Um, definitely a movie I watched a lot at that age. I, I think. E.T. and Jurassic Park have a lot in common for me, which is love them and watch them a lot as a kid and teenager, and then just kind of didn't continue a relationship with them, um, where like there's a period of maybe 15 years where I watched them once or twice over that time. But then the great thing is both of those movies coming back to as a like adult plus um, and, and being like, oh yeah, this, these movies are doing so many smart things that I didn't appreciate at the time. So it's kind of, whereas, you know, you watch Goonies as an adult or something, you're like, what is happening? <laughs> this yeah. movie's insane. Um, but I feel like, um, I, I feel like rewatching ET for the first time in a while was, was, I was just like, oh yeah, I remember the kid wonder that I had at the time. And just like the fun of it, like this movie is it likes to have fun when it likes to have fun. I wasn't as scarred by the dark stuff as other people. And, and in fact, was probably like, yeah, it's metal. Um, <laughs> but uh, but then also like now as an adult watching and just being like, oh, yeah, there, there's so there's so many smart, as you were saying, Trisha, there's so many like smart writing choices and directorial choices. And you're seeing Spielberg do some of his Spielberg stuff without being too 
in your face about it. Like there are oneers that aren't doing the like in your face oneers, which is Spielberg is usually good about those being uh, like the um, God, what's the oh, right before Elliot comes home. Uh, when she's at the mom's at the fridge and then the guy's there interviewing and it's like it's all just one frame but there's so many different things going on and then Elliot is revealed uh, behind the the fridge door and everything I was just like um, close the door why is the door open for so long <laughs> <laughs> so if you're letting all the cold out uh, my partner does that and I'm always like just close it like, it's not, doesn't <laughs> does she reveal open. a child every yeah, time yeah, exactly. <laughs> cause I would be I'm always afraid someone's gonna show <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, really, really excited to get into it. And, you know, Trisha, knowing your thing about symbols, I was just tracking that and being like, oh yeah, look at those, look at these flowers, look at them, <laughs> you know, look at these keys, look at this candy, like the things that are just like right there in your face in ways that are kind of inviting you to, to draw meaning from them. Um, so yeah, looking forward to getting into it. This episode is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected, so you can explore the best of cinema streaming anytime, anywhere. Out now from Mubi is The Substance. The Substance is a tour de force and visionary shock to the system by director Carly Farja. It was the winner of Best Screenplay at Cannes and the Midnight Madness Award at TIFF, and here to tell us more about it is our very own Alex Calleros. I went and saw Substance just kind of on a whim the other week uh, by myself, which was perfect <laughs> because this movie is wild. Uh, I really loved it. Uh, it's got a fearless Demi Moore uh, as starring as a former A-lister who's drawn to a mysterious drug which promises to generate a younger, better version of herself. Uh, the way that self is generated is very body horror. So this is not a movie for the faint of heart, but this movie is executed with such like a sharp wit, this really dark comedic sensibility and the performances from Demi Moore and then Margaret Pauly, who plays kind of her younger, better self. So funny, so perfect. Uh, it's just the way it's shot is just so balls to the wall and the, you know, the music, the sound, it's firing on all cylinders. The finale almost goes too far for my taste, but it does a thing. IndieWire said it is an immensely, unstoppably, ecstatically demented fairy tale. That is a very good description. Cool. Okay. Well, visit trythesubstance.com for showtimes and tickets. And to stream great films at home, you can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash beyond the screenplay. That's M U B I dot com slash beyond the screenplay for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thank you to Mubi for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. All right. Well, let's do it. Well, yeah. So, symbols since we're here do you want to talk about symbols in et and yeah brian's already mentioned the flowers which i feel like are really good clear one kind of a litmus test that kind of let you know how et is doing and how you're sort of supposed yeah. right. to feel throughout which kind of helps ground you it's the back to the future polaroid <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sure yeah. um yeah no I, I think that when you are especially if you're doing like sort of a fairy tale or Again, tapping into this, um, you know, older story form, you know, like if you think about a fairy tale, you think about Cinderella, like here's a glass slipper, here's, um, you know, a, a poisoned apple, here are these like magical objects that for some reason we connect with and associate with, right? They become iconic images um, because they have meaning within the context of the story and they like... Uh, represent obviously larger ideas. That's all symbols are, right? They just represent other things, just something that represents something else. Um, and if you are, are telling this kind of a story about childhood um, and you're borrowing from sort of fairy tale ideas, there's nothing smarter that you can do that than like adding those in and establishing them early on. Um, I think The Flowers is an interesting one because it actually doesn't come in until essentially midway through the movie, right? Gertie grabs the flower pot and puts it on uh, the wagon as she's going to visit E.T. and Elliot in their room. And like the flowers are already dead, but we don't really see them before that. Um, of course, the flowers are already dead. And right, there's something already that has like died in this like house in this family. Mm. So 
there's neglect happening. Also, we see that from the mom character. <laughs> this time around watching it as a parent now, mm. <laughs> I was like, she literally like, Gertie, I've got to go pick up Elliot from school. Just watch TV, honey. And like leaves her four-year-old like, right. in the I, house the by 80s. herself. It's I know it was crazy. the 80s, but but there is something very purposefully neglectful about the mom character, right? Where she's in the room with E.T., several times and doesn't notice him because she's doing other things. Right. Um, like, so there is something very pointed about, even though we don't think of her necessarily as being a bad mother, there's something very pointed about that neglect. Anyway, the plants have died. All of this to say, right. The mom is so wrapped up in her own emotional distress, which is valid, right. She's going through a divorce, but still things have fallen by the wayside. Gertie grabs the plants. The plants have died. Um, and then E.T.'s presence into their life is reconnecting them. Um, it's interesting, again, that Gertie is the one who brings that in. When we first meet the siblings, they are fractured. They, you know, um, the older brother is always picking on, on Elliot. And both of them are, like, ignoring Gertie or treating her like a burden. And then the more that they E.T. Um, unites them uh, or gets it wrapped up in their lives, the more they start talking to each other and they are honest with each other um, until the very end when like the older brother and his friends who the first time we meet them are picking on Elliot then become like his protectors and saviors in the last like third of the movie. So the flowers are a symbol of all of that um, that is being brought back to life in the life of this little boy and in the life of this family. And then when E.T. dies again, we are f afraid that we're losing that. So I don't know. To me, it's like if you want to just read the flowers as being a symbol for E.T.'s health, I guess you could, mm -hmm. right? Like, but there's so much more to them. That's what symbols are, right? Or they have the potential to be, they can be layered. Um, and I think the flowers are, yeah, probably the most prominent one in the movie, but there are others, as you mentioned, Brian, like um, there's candy, there's something playful about candy, right? Um, like how you lure a pet into your house is to give it <laughs> candy. And um, it lowers our defenses against like the danger of ET, right? Like, this is not a horror movie. You don't lure the horror monster into your house with Reese's Pieces. <laughs> and so it's, there's something about the choice of candy, again, that's very childlike. This is what a kid would do. And, um, you know, you can kind of like parse that apart if you want to. And there are a variety of other things. The keys work really well as just like a, we're not going to show you this guy's face, but we need to distinguish him in some way. Here's some keys. Mm -hmm. We can hear them. We can see them. That's all you need. It's all just smart storytelling. His name is Keys on IMDb. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was interesting thinking about the connection to Hook, which I yep. guess came out several years after, but felt very much in the same wheelhouse to me. Actually, like watching it this time and Hook, I was obsessed with as a kid, watched over and over and over again, but is also a movie, you know, about childhood, about a neglectful parent that's, fantastical and has a kind of weird tone and that like the dark things and the disturbing things are dark and disturbed. Like there's this weird mis like combination of maturity and childlike wonder that I feel like is found in both of those films. And yeah, so it was just interesting to realize that that was so much of a thing of that Spielberg was interested in and how much of that was, was put into this movie, which you can see in the execution as well as the writing, but the, the filmmaking as well. For sure. I mean, it's something that runs through all of Spielberg's f filmography is he has this deep connection to just childhood emotional experiences that he's somehow carried with him into adulthood. You know, you, you just feel in movies like this, like he's still on a, like a gut level gets these kind of uh, hard to put into words, hard to describe just childhood feelings of being kind of like alone in the house when your parents aren't home and you're up to something and it's kind of exciting and magical. And he's finding this kind of sci-fi uh, vessel with which to explore these kind of nostalgic things that we've lost as we grow up. We, we can't go back here anymore. And he's replicating them in these movies through the kid actors and through the situation. And, and I think that's also um, 
juxtaposed with the complexity uh, that's going on in these movies too, which is like, I always think of like the family dynamics of like everyone talking over each other all the time, right? He does that in Close Encounters. He does it in Jaws. It's just like, it's too much. There are too many people talking. There's too many things happening. Um, and then also with the darkness, you know, the, 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 the whole third act of this movie really um, it, it is like, you don't get, you, you sort of don't earn the joy unless you bring all of the, all of the, the ick, you know? And I, and I feel like that's the thing there were, weirdly, I was reading that the studio was when, when Spielberg pitched the movie, the studio was like, Oh, that's just like Disney, like family, blech. like it's like too safe or it's too whatever. And I'm like, man, d- imagine in the age of like our Disney overlords and, you know, Marvel and all this kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. that like, that they were like, Oh, it's too family friendly. It's too kiddish or whatever. Right. And then, and then ironically, it's like ET is the movie where we're like, Oh my God, can you believe how, like how hard that, th- that crisis goes and like how like scary and everything it is. Um, and I feel like there, there is, that is kind of what Spielberg does that. I think a lot of other, kid movies from this generation don't do quite as much is this sort of feeling of like there there is an adult feeling to all of this there is a complexity to this there is a darkness to all of this but then within that comes the joy and the wonder and and the sort of the breath of fresh air that you get from some of these these really lovely moments well i think and you could also argue that you know spielberg and connecting to his childhood and the intensity of the emotions he felt you know Childhood includes these incredibly intense emotions that are dark and scary. And you, you, if you confront death or confront a loss in your life, like as a child, that's like extra heightened and extra disturbing. Um, and so in some ways, it's like we're like, oh, yeah, this, this shouldn't be in a kid's movie. That's too dark. But, you know, life is life and kids are exposed to dark stuff in life and disturbing things happen in their own lives. And it's interesting how, yeah, Spielberg's, especially his 80s kind of childhood wonder movies aren't afraid to go to those places. And it almost seems like he's interested in exploring those places through the lens of a child. And it's interesting too. I think the first few scenes that we have with Elliot um, are really important in sort of setting up what's wrong. Right. Um, And, and just who Elliot is kind of, and, and, you know, I mentioned earlier where, he wants to play with his older brother and all their friends that are playing D&D and they're ignoring him. They treat him like a kid. They treat him like he is, you know, basically not old enough, not mature enough, not cool enough to hang out with them. He gets bullied at the bus stop. I think that's really interesting too. Um, and, you know, they don't believe him when he says he saw something in the shed, right? Um, there's just this constant like pushing to the side But in some ways, Elliot is more in touch with reality than a lot of these other characters are because he is the one who is bringing it out at the dinner table, right? The source of the conflict, right? Where the mom is trying to kind of paper over everything and she's like, no, Elliot, everything's fine. Um, Why don't you call your dad and tell him about it? Like uh, trying to make it all okay, the family situation. And it's Elliot that says like, I can't call him. He's in Mexico, right? Like he is not here. Something is absent. Something is broken here. And he's the one who's not afraid to name it. Um, I think it's really interesting that the rawness of that character and his willingness to kind of confront the problem is what makes him then a perfect person for E.T. to meet. Um, The story of E.T. connecting with Elliot is just a story about empathy, right? Like seeing yourself in the other, um, in something dramatically different than you. E.T. is inadvertently abandoned by his people. Um, and you have these two characters who essentially like are desperate to connect with something or someone who are also very like emotionally in touch, right? E.T. is like this fish out of water, like new baby, essentially blank slate. Um, and he meets Elliot and there's, I think it's interesting. We have to get into this, but like the fact that their, their emotional connection is then literalized to be like a physical, like brainwave, like we are the same person connection, which is in no way explained by the movie why that would be a thing, <laughs> yeah. um, is uh, it makes intuitive sense, even if it doesn't make logical sense, right? Because again, we see the emotional state of Elliot at the beginning of the movie with those opening few scenes. 
Yeah, that sequence was hard for me. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the beer drinking uh, classroom. Yeah. The classroom. Sequence. The frog. Yeah. It's yeah. very act two fun and games. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I was just so, it took me a really long time to put together what was happening. Mm. And then Elliot was feeling what, yeah, E.T. was feeling physiologically as well as emotionally uh, that he could be drunk, that E.T. could watch someone dance and kiss on someone on a television and that would cause Elliot to do it. Like the lack of logic like broke my brain and I just like wasn't able to interface with it. Uh, Was honestly sort of my like experience with the whole movie. But I think like hearing all this, like I kind of want, and this is probably blasphemous, but a really good remake of E.T. could hit really hard right now because I feel like a lot of the things Mm. that you're talking about of just like this basic like empathy connection with an other this feeling of kind of being abandoned like I feel like these are all emotions that culturally I think we're experiencing and I think set yeah in a modern time potentially dealing with the loneliness that comes from Social media, social media, all these things. Like, we can't have it now, Michael. There's no wonder anymore. <laughs> but like, and I guess that's that would be the miracle is like if you could make a movie with wonder like this for a modern audience with maybe some more modern film language to make it a little bit more accessible to those of us that chafe against <laughs> <laughs> the look and sound of 80s movies. Uh, I thought you were going to say the look and sound of E.T., which we can also oh, talk right. about. <laughs> yeah. So we'll talk about Scary. Yeah. Born yes. Wrinkly yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the sound design and some of those early scenes. But yeah, Brian, sorry. No, it's Are Ben you? Burt. Ben Burt, ben ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny. Like, this is kind of tangential to what Michael was saying, but this sort of what you said, Trisha, there's no wonder these days. I was thinking about the sort of long first act that movies could get away with when we hadn't seen these movies yet, right? So it's like, if, oh my gosh, there's an alien and we're meeting it and everyone around us is meeting it, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my gosh, I am developing superpowers or, oh my gosh, I'm that whatever these movies were that it was like, when we hadn't seen these movies before, you could spend a really long time alien, right? You could spend a really long time building up to what's happening and what's coming. But now we've seen all those movies. And then now it's like, it's hard because now it's like, oh, we just want to get to the good stuff. We want to skip all that stuff, right? And I'm not saying movies are doing that, but it's almost like if you pitched a movie like, oh, an alien shows up and and meets a family and whatever, it would be like, okay, like not just because we've seen E.T., it would be like, but then what, then who do they battle? Then what's the, you know what I mean? Like, like what's the, what's the big thing? What's the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because you can't get away as easily. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but you can't get away as easily these days with just a very small story about one character meeting a few other characters. And like, that's kind of, and then there is this, these bad guys closing in kind of thing. But, but even, even without that, there's just so much drama and conflict and dramatic question and wonder to be had from just E.T. meeting Elliot and meeting the family that I feel like, I don't know if you can do that these days and, and compel people the same. It'd have to be like a micro budget indie. Yeah. Yeah. There's no in between. See, but I think, I think there could be though. Like I think a really big budget, like go hard, unabashed, like we're going to do the thing again. Like the way that like Top Gun came out of nowhere and kind of surprised people with like the kind of throwbackiness. I don't know. There's something I mean, about Stranger Things has true. That's true. Has basically remade big parts of E.T. <laughs> and Firestarter. Like Drew Barrymore needs to show up in the final season. <laughs> For sure. That's a good point. Anyway, I just think it would be interesting. And as someone that yeah, aesthetically has problems with the cinematography and yes, the design of ET. I think we should talk about the design of ET and what you know what happened. Well, quickly spending <laughs> spending one more moment on the wonder, which will mm-hmm. lead us into mm-hmm. the design of ET. I do think that not having access to unlimited technology that can make things look amazing all the time, um, like there were, you know, not Jaws level problems with the puppets, but there were problems with the puppets. Um, 
And they are ultimately like puppets. There's animatronics happening. There's essentially creature design. Um, The way that this movie is shot is designed to hide those things, but it also cultivates wonder, right? Like I think about the scenes in even any, any of those scenes, right? Like any scene with E.T. is basically shot to keep us in the perspective of Elliot or in the perspective of someone who's just like kind of watching from behind a table (laughs) or like uh, in a shadow or right. Like the way it's lit, there's always like, yeah, really low lighting or, you know, very sharp directional lighting. We are halfway behind an object. We are like in a closet looking through the slats. Um, And there's like a single shaft of light falling onto E.T.'s face. It's beautiful. It's beautiful filmmaking. It's also doing something very purposeful, which is hiding creature design um, that doesn't look photorealistic if you photograph it. Like the stuff where E.T. is out in bright, bright sunlight is rough. (laughs) Um, Like the stuff in the forest at night where it's all misty and foggy and like there's only a few lights from the spaceship shining. It's beautiful. Great. Oh, the moon is shining Ooh, okay but like all of it is doing something and and i think that that's very smart filmmaking spielberg was so good at this um before he had access to i mean he this is cutting edge technology for what it is um but when you had to hide stuff there's no one better at hiding stuff and again making you lean forward in your seat you want to see more of it and then what you can show in full you know elliot's face top to bottom of the frame, just with the most magical look of wonder on his face, that sells it to you. And then you cut to a shot of E.T. and he's like sort of halfway, like you can only see this much of his face behind a table. And then you hear like an, ooh, it's funny. It's hilarious. But I buy that E.T.'s in the room because of the trickery, essentially, Mm -hmm. right? It's magic because it's movie magic. And that's what really great filmmaking is capable of. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you know, we talked about this with uh, Jurassic Park and Lord of the Rings, which was the way they got away with a lot of the visual stuff was by not doing the same trick twice in a row. Um, So it's no, this time it's forced perspective, this time it's CG, this time it's a miniature. Um, And, you know, Spielberg loves his, he does this with Raiders, uh, also the sort of the very slow reveal, right? We see E.T., we see his silhouette, and then we see his eyes, and then we see this. And I also love, like, movies from this time had this smoky texture, like any fan of, like, Legend or Blade Runner. It's just, like, there's always smoke, and there's always, like... <laughs> Michael's like, losing his mind slowly. It's, like, the smokiest house I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, get out it's of there, kids. It's pitch black. Yeah. It's full of smoke. It's a child's bedroom. There's a single light outside Michael, instead of Michael, smoke is my rain, Okay. <laughs> even the sink was like extra steamy in that one shot right right (laughs) it turns on the sink it's like the sink the hottest water of all time (laughs) it's like so much steam um but then the lighting the silhouettes the the people emerging from darkness the sort of the 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 thing that spielberg loves where it's just the light is only on someone's eyes or they they emerge just enough for the light to be on their eyes um and uh, and then even the way that the that the adults are shot, it's not just oh we're always weirdly shooting the bottom half of the of what would be the frame. It's like no, we're focusing so much on these kids' faces, you don't even notice the teacher. That's just like a thing over there, right? Or even the keys. You're like oh I'm looking at the keys and the house in the background. I'm not thinking about the fact I'm not seeing this guy's face. It's not perfect. Every once in a while, there's like a shot of a guy and he's like scratching his head so that you can't see his face or whatever. Um, It's like the Michael Jordan character in Air who is like always like looking away (laughs) at like a painting on the wall so that we don't see that it's not Michael Jordan. Um, But uh, anyway, uh, all of that to say that uh, that I, I did appreciate that like the way that things were done it was always being done a different way. So it never it never felt to me like, oh, there's the trick and now I'm just seeing the trick over and over again. It always felt like there was a different, there was like a, a playfulness to the way things were being either hidden or obstructed or revealed or whatever. Yeah, uh, this time around was literally the first time with my analytical hat on that I was like, 
oh, those kids are going to put on sunglasses and pull their hoods up and they're put, pull their hats mm-hmm. right, down because right. they have to do a bicycle I am a chase. Stunt person. And yeah. I am now a stunt person. Here is my. And yeah. Elliot's six foot, like, stand in. <laughs> stunt person is going to ride his bike. I mean, it's, you know, it's motivated. They're kids. They think they're secret agents, right? Like, yeah, it, it works. It, it totally works. And it's literally the first time I was like, no, they're just hiding the fact that those are stunt people. But again, if it's doing a couple of things at the same time, it's good filmmaking. Yeah. Like I think in my in my hypothetical, which is I guess how I'm choosing to interface with this movie, the remake Fine. of this movie, uh, I wouldn't want to lose any of that like technique. Cause as you guys are saying, it's creating wonder, it's doing multiple things. I think I was able to feel a little bit of like the hands being bound though. Like I think the freedom to do the most wonderful shot and not the most wonderful shot we can get away with when all we have is like E.T.'s face hugger fingers that we can put in the, like the corner of the frames to do stuff like, like using modern technology so that like you're, when you cut to E.T.'s face, it can still be obscure. It can still draw our focus to the eyes, but it's photorealistic eyes, not special edition slapped on. Eye, like, I just feel like modern technology brought to bear on this, the same like wonder and fusion things. Like I just feel like we've learned so much and it'd be really fun to see that used for this purpose. Cause we haven't seen modern filmmaking used to create wonder. And I think that's, that was anyway, what I walked away from with with this is this desire of I want I want this wonder. It's gonna be I want it to be not a, a movie of Michael meeting humans and learning how to feel. <laughs> 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 MT, the mopey terrestrial. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Um Alex, you looked like you had a thought. Yeah, well, we mentioned um the way the adults are shot. And it was it was a thing that it's both, and this is also a product of just like, this is made in 1982 and we're so cynical and I've seen everything now, but it was almost a little too much for me in the beginning where it's just like, we're so aggressively shooting all these men in silhouette and only the flashlights and like, it's cool at first. And I'm like, okay, I get what you're doing here. You know, and it, it helped me identify with ET more than humans, which I thought was very smart. Like we begin with these plant collecting kind of little, you know, nature guys <laughs> and and then he, the humans yeah, what are they doing here i think they're just collecting plant specimens they're just collecting specimens yeah they can't walk but they can make a spaceship okay continue it's, christmas is coming up they um <laughs> th- i totally had no memory of like their like arboretum <laughs> inside their ship that's so 80s <laughs> like they're like with their like mushrooms and stuff but anyway but uh but the opening sequence i i liked what it was doing because i understood okay i'm i'm with the alien humans are actually scary in this movie um they're kind of the danger of the bad guys uh but then it just it, in that kind of a little bit on the nose spielberg way just the way there's so much of like all the men in silhouette are now marching up to the thing or marching up to the house or like the way they were walking down the street, you know, rolling the things. That's that yeah. shot is wild. It's just, like, <laughs> it's just like, there's something that's like a little too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where it's like, it, it feels like this era of Spielberg where he's still a young director. It's just like, he's, he's flexing. He's, he's bringing all these images and techniques from all these classical films, these noir films that he loves and has studied and so I appreciate it and I get what he's doing, but yeah, I, I, I can feel there's a little bit of a try hard sometimes, um, that comes from being an amazing young filmmaker who's like flexing and, and discovering your film language. Um, but I think in those cases, it was like, I both am appreciating Spielberg and also feeling like, oh, like you're still young in, in kind of a way that I can tell, like you're doing a thing really hard versus kind of having faith that you can kind of do it with a gentler touch and it will get across the same emotion. Do you you guys have that feeling watching this? That there's kind of like an early Spielberg try hard or is that just me compared to, compared to like later films like Jurassic Park. Don't ask Michael. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm leaving room for others. Yeah. It's hard for me to know what's early Spielberg and what's eighties gonna eighties. Right. Sure. Personally. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's kind of what I was going to say, which is just, yeah, there's like a, an aesthetic here that is 
of its time. Um, I do think you are right. Spielberg was, was, I believe, like 32, maybe, when he made this movie. So young. Um, but, uh, yeah, I do think that there is... It, it makes sense that a modern viewer would bump on some of these techniques because they really do call attention to themselves. Right. Um, in a way that we kind of like don't like anymore. Right. Um, and like that's just like a taste now. thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, we should probably get back to the creature design really, because I do think it's wild. Like, you know, it has become iconic now and like, I haven't really thought about it in a while, but watching it this time, I was like, I'm sorry, you went with, you could have picked anything, right? Like, that's the thing, is that you're making up an alien species. You can you can make them anything. Um, and you're trying to sell us on this connection between this little boy and this alien. Like, it's a story of this deep love and friendship and, like, again, empathy. Um, and you went with this. And it's, like humanoid but upsetting um <laughs> the, the long and goofy yeah. like in addition to being just goofy as hell uh and I, I don't know i'm like astounded in hindsight that it works so um maybe i've aired all of michael's gripes or do you have more michael i want to hear how michael feels about the designer but just all his unvarnished thoughts uh, well no yeah i mean I, I think you've you captured it but it but i think it it is interesting that clearly it works like clearly you know this is one of the most successful movies of all time it moves people does all these things i feel like and maybe this is a little bit of the the young directorness that you were feeling alex i i felt like there was a lot of bold lucky decisions mm. made in the making of this that probably would not make any sense on paper but when all combined in this way created something that was like special and unique. And so I think the design of E.T., while I agree is upsetting and prevents me personally from having any emotional connection to it whatsoever, I think still is, does this like, it makes the empathy of the kid stronger, mm -hmm. I think. And I think it, it ultimately is in service of the, the arc that is happening in a way that if it was just like a cute, fluffy little bunny with big ears and big right. eyes, I just want to kick in the face. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have worked in the same way. And so I think it's this weird, non-intuitive choice that for some reason is exactly the right one for this movie. It's bold, for sure. Um, and, and I think that there's something about it that, like, I like. It's a weird thing where, like, I haven't thought about it in, in 35 years, right? I'm just like, that's that's E.T. That's what E.T. looks like. But it's like there is something scary about him. And then there is something really unsettling about seeing him, his wrinkly gray body, you know, on the bathroom floor and stuff. And it's like, that's not Grogu, right? Where it's just like, look at this right. cute little thing. And it's going to be cute. And it's going to try to eat everything. And like, that's its entire character, right? It's like, no, there's, there is a, there's something about, I was talking about the sort of complexity of, of childhood. And I think there's a complexity to ET as well, where it's like, it's not just saying like, look how cute it is, right? It's like, it's kind of a pet. It's kind of a child. It's kind of an adult. It's kind of cute. It's kind of freaky. It's kind of weird. And, I, and again, I like that. I don't know how they got to this final design, but I do like that it that it's able to do all those things at once. Mm -hmm. It's there's There's literally a gag in this movie where he sees Yoda walk by and is mm -hmm. like, home, home. Um, and this movie is very Star Wars aware or mm -hmm. it's very, like we are taking we are taking place in the time of Star Wars. Um, and I, I can reverse engineer a little bit looking at the design. Uh, it's almost like, OK, there's alien grays, you know, there's the classic alien gray, which is like the slender, big head, big eyes kind of creepy thing. And then we have Yoda, which is lovable and we know it kind of works. Uh, Yoda kind of waddles around at a short uh, child size. Uh, so I can see there being this kind of mesh of like Yoda somehow works and we all love Yoda, but also we're going for that like classic extraterrestrial UFO story, kind of taking that more, yeah, weird, small alien gray being and melding them together uh, is kind of, I can see the logic there of like, we're going for the Star Wars Cuteness mixed with a bit more of the Area 51 story. 
Yeah. And I think it is important that it is important that E.T. has powers, right? Like the scale of E.T. is childlike, but he has to be capable of things, right? Like he has to be supernatural, half powers, both for plot reasons and um, for like the emotionality, like the thematic reasons, right? Because, um, you know, Elliot is looking for someone that can show him something like they have to teach each other. And so if you had some kind of creature that was completely vulnerable, um, like a pet, right. That you had to like feed it constantly and depend, like it depended completely upon you, then you kind of lose that reciprocal empathy, right. Where it's like, in some ways, E.T. is really advanced. Um, he has to be childlike in scale and childlike in wonder, but he has to also have powers. And I love the way the powers are revealed. Um, like, you know, he first starts to read really you know, quickly and we kind of, it's interesting that sequence that breaks Michael's brain, but like it, it is showing us something crucial in terms of expository work where it's like, here's what E.T. can do, right? Like when he's home by himself, he can read a whole book. He can explore his environment in certain ways. He can start to learn to speak, all of these things. And then like we see eventually like he can levitate things, right? Like he can heal things. Um, all of these things come out of that middle act where it seems like it's just fun and games and it's hiding the fact that it's setting up other things. Um, but it's also doing character work for the relationship where we buy in more to it when we realize that E.T. has something to offer Elliot. Um, and that's really tricky to handle also and wrap into the design, right? He can't be too human-like or then when he's levitating stuff, we wonder how it, he's doing that. Or like when his chest lights up or like the other supernatural powers he has. He has to look other enough and it's just this really fine tightrope to walk that I think the movie does really spectacularly. It's interesting. Thinking about that middle act again, um, going back to my feeling I mentioned earlier where this movie can almost be read as maybe kind of like you can read it as an imaginary friend, as an, an expression of a childhood transition up until the adults know about him. And then it's like very real like there's there definitely is an alien here and they're studying it and it has different dna than us and all this all these scientific facts come out but i think there's something about et's magic that you know if, if we were to remake this film today i would almost want to somehow preserve the possible reading of the film as non-literal because even his phone home device makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> it's a saw and like a, you know. A record player a record, yeah. and a fork. Yeah. yeah. And an umbrella. <laughs> and an umbrella. Yeah. yeah. Definitely the best way to transmit a signal to outer space. Um, but it's the, it's exactly what a kid would make to send a message to out, outer space. And so there's something beautiful about all that because it's, it's, it's like that's what I would have made as a kid in my fort with my brother to make a you know space transmission. <clears throat> but this movie asks us to also believe, you know, he actually sent the transmission using this device and the ship did come and respond to it. Um, and so, yeah, there's something about his magic and the way E.T. manifests in that second act that, yeah, I would I would be curious to see a version of this movie where you could conceivably read the entire thing as a transition happening inside of Elliot and you know, all it's all allegory. And then there's, there, there's a resolution at the end, but the adults never find out about E.T. You know, it was all amongst the kids and they've changed, but the adults kind of don't get involved. Um, and in some ways, I think the movie would have worked better for me on, on this viewing if that was the case, because then there's not that schism in the, the world and the rules of what actually makes sense here. I love that little tiny moment where Elliot tells Gertie, like, Adults can't see him, only little kids, right? right? And then, of course, it's just a it's just like a joke where then Gertie goes like, "Give me a break," um, but it kind of speaks to what you're talking about, Alex, right. right? Which is like probably only little kids actually can see ET. Yeah, yeah. The really quickly, also the kids' performances were really good. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, like, I mean, Drew Barrymore is hilarious, and it's so weird to see her that young. But like all the kids and how they feel like as a family, like I totally 
But I was kind of excited that the older brother was so involved in everything. Because in my memory, like I didn't remember him being involved, but that it was the three of them coming together and that their dynamic felt so believable was just really well handled and executed. And I feel like is is the life and the heart of the movie. And so just like, again, Spielberg working with kids and doing it amazingly, like mm-hmm. somehow. Right, super like, Right, yeah. Truly. Like in a way that is so, so rare to see in a movie. So just want to call that out. The performances are, are really good by the kids. If you haven't seen the Henry Thomas uh, audition tape, that like it's go- gone viral, but it's just like, it's him doing a scene and just crying and being so intense and everything at the end. Spielberg just goes, okay, kid, you got the part. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that, that tape is crazy. Cause it's like, like who is this kid that feels so deeply? He's just right. like, tears are just flowing from his face as he does a monologue. It's wild. Well, and again, like you have this relationship and the central relationship of the movie is between a human actor and a puppet. Right. And you have to really, that's the whole movie. You have to sell us on it completely 100%. With the crisis, the climax, it's all about the relationship between these two. Um, And I feel like the human side of that just has to be rock solid. It has to be like, you have to have Elliot standing in that, framed in that circular window of the tiny casket that they have ready for (laughs) E.T., Um, with the dry eyes. Yeah. yeah. I, it's, and, and like, even before that, right? Like screaming while he's like on the table next to E.T. And like trying to get out of the the, the people who are restraining him and everything. Um, it all has to be real for the character. Um, and I think there are a variety of ways that directors work with children. And children can be professional actors in the way that everybody else can. Um, but this movie was shot chronologically to help the young actors like stay with the emotional arc of their characters and, and in the story. And I think that that's really smart. Um, and yeah, I just, I can't reiterate enough how maybe having an actual physical puppet to look at and interact with, even if it's not photorealistic is probably going to get better performances out of your actors, especially if they're young children can get, uh, <laughs> Emotional with a stuffed animal um, that is not in any way interacting with them. If you give them any kind of puppet, even if they can see your hand in it, it's going to be better than what you're going to get otherwise. Yeah. When I think about why is that sequence so disturbing to me as a kid, you know, the the whole hospitalization sequence, a lot of it sure. is Elliot's performance, you know, it's because it's so raw and so intense and so, you know, disturbing. <laughs> and it's just you, you don't see that many. You don't see that often, you know like child performances that are that raw and that emotional um, that don't have that kind of sense of like, I'm a kid who's acting really upset, but I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even for me that I had trouble interfacing with ET as an entity because of the performances, like you were saying, Trisha, I believe that these people care about this rubber thing in their kitchen and they care. So I care. And like, it's enough to like take me on that emotional journey. So that's that I feel like for sure stands the test of time, which is good. Humans always good. Yeah, we are. (laughs) Why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from ET. Brian, do you want to start us off? Uh, Sure. A pretty simple lesson about just people finding things out is exciting to watch. And I was like, watch, I was watching this movie being like, oh, this is just like people finding things out the movie, like (laughs) surprise the movie where it's just this long, you know, it creates this dramatic question and then a release, right? It's, it's, is anyone going to see E.T.? Is Elliot going to see E.T.? Is he going to fully see what it is versus kind of see what it is then? is the brother going to see it? Is the daughter going to see it? When's the mom? The mom is like a full, you know, 40 minutes of this movie of like, is she going to see it? Is she going to see it? She's not seeing it. Ooh, is she going to see it? Um, but I just realized I was like, oh yeah, so many of the like dumb, real TikTok, whatever, you know, the little, the little ones, <laughs> yeah. the little <laughs> rectangles that go up instead of sideways. Um, 
uh, it's like prank videos and people finding out they're on camera and so soldier surprises his mom who you know, hasn't been home and whatever. And like a celebrity surprising a fan and a proposal. It's always like someone being surprised by something, someone finding something out that they didn't know before. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm such a sucker for that. But I feel like we all are. Um, and then, and then even E.T.'s powers then becomes like the next finding things out. Oh my gosh, you can do this. Oh my gosh, we can, we could do this. Um, and I think that this movie is doing a good job of, I was thinking about procedurals is always like someone coming, the opening scenes, someone comes home and finds their, their partner dead or their, you know, their boss or whatever. And it's not, we see it as the audience. It's, we are watching someone else find that out, right? We are watching their surprise. So kind of, as, as you were saying, Michael, like the actor's performances is, is doing so much work in this movie because it's not just, ooh, E.T. can fly or E.T. can do things. We're watching other people find that out for the first time. And we are feeling that through watching them. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think it's just these two powerful things, which are both kind of screenwriting 101 things, one of which is like a change in emotional state, right? Someone going from happy to sad, someone going from sad to happy, essentially, et cetera, um, which that's what surprise is, is going from I didn't know this thing to I did know this thing. But then the dramatic question, the buildup of that, you know, even, even shows that do like a will they, won't they, once the question is yes, they will, then it's who's going to find out, when are they going to find out, how are they going to find out? You know, the office does that, friends does that. Um, so I just think it's like, these two sort of this setup and really Mad Men, the the pilot is like, here's a thing that's revealed to the audience. But then the audience's question is, is are people going to find out about this? Shaun of the Dead, the whole sequence of like, we know zombies are here. When is everyone else going to figure it out? When is when Sean going to figure it out? Um, so yeah, just these these very two simple things of like the, the setup, the dramatic question of is someone going to find something out? And then the release of watching that emotional change, I just think is it does a lot of work in this movie. And it's just cool to remember that that's like something we are we are suckers for and we like watching. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good lesson. And I feel like it kind of goes into something I was thinking about when watching this um, lesson-wise. And is sort of, as I was talking about thinking about how would you remake this movie? What would modern film language, you know, this is an old, this is a 42 year old movie. Like it's, it's old. Uh, and filmmaking <laughs> language has, it's, it's not, I mean, not the, there's something wrong Michael. with being 42. I mean, it's, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I heard a nine year old last week refer to something. He was telling me about something. He said, Oh, it's based on this really old YouTube video. And my, <laughs> and no. my beard Boo. went entirely no. white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Retro uh, YouTube. Yeah. There was a post on the Star Wars subreddit recently where there's often over the years been like, hey, like, you know, older Star Wars fans, what was it like to see like Empire Strikes Back and the thing? And this was like, hey, older Star Wars fans, what was it like to see Attack of the Clones in theaters? Really? Yeah. Where it's like, well, well, like, well, how do people react to you? Anyway, uh, that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, the, the, the simplicity of what you're saying of like, it's fun to watch people find things out like just like these basic fundamental aspects i was thinking about that with like the editing too i was recently on a, a patreon led uh <laughs> youtube panel video called digital spaghetti where we looked at different youtube videos and three of us you know analyzed them one of them was the every frame of painting video that's a classic that's about editing and like what what is editing how's it work and there's a quote in there from Thelma Schoonmaker who's Scorsese's editor uh and she's saying like you know I'm finding nowadays that I don't believe things people are sticking things out there and asking you to believe it but not making you believe it and I feel like watching E.T was a reminder of like why being slow, methodical, having fun reveals, having big buildups as Spielberg -y as it can be, like why that is fun. Like it makes you believe it and it draws you in. And, and that was sort of this weird cognitive dissonance I was having where every time E.T. was on screen, I was like, nope, that's nope, that's not a thing. But I was still in the world of the movie and along for the ride, despite knowing it wasn't real. I still 
believed in the reality of the film. And it was a, a weird experience. So that's kind of a, a thing that I'm taking away from this movie and this approach to filmmaking that's partially just technically demanded, but as we were saying, is also doing wonder, mystery creation, drawing you in and not feeling rushed or ashamed. We don't have that fear of, well, we've seen this movie a million times. Yeah, you were saying this, Brian. So like, we have to skip past all the stuff. Like, no, like, the, this is the fun part. The mystery mm-hmm. is the fun mm-hmm. part. The revealing is the fun part. Don't skip past the fun part. And yeah, E.T. doesn't skip past the fun part. And on that note, I think it's smart that we know that there are aliens, right? The opening scene is aliens, but we don't know who they are, what they are. We aren't shown everything about them before Elliot is, right? So like, we know that it's an alien. We see the spaceship. We kind of see parts of E.T.'s body and we see, you know, the uh, his family, <laughs> civilization, <laughs> tribe, um, walking around. But again, it doesn't tell us everything, right? There's a lot that that holds back. So that then seeing Elliot figure out some of the more specific things about E.T. and then discover him as well, that's still fun, right? That there's still reveals to be had. Um, And also, it's the right amount of time. We know we're ahead of Elliot, but not for that long, right? Like, not for that long. For a while, like, we're actually with, for the bulk of the runtime, we're actually with Elliot in terms of what we're learning about E.T. It's like, we're only ahead of him for, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, maybe. Um, The rest of it, we're actually in his POV. And then those are the reveals that we see as they go along. Yeah. Yeah. Also, quick shout out, midpoint E.T. phone home. Mm Yep. That was kind of cool. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a midpoint. It's another another one for the books. (laughs) Alex, what's your lesson? Um, Yeah, I just keep going back to just how good Spielberg is at making these finding a way to use the, the frame, the experience of childhood to explore kind of a high concept idea. And so when you think about like an alien movie or a first contact movie, you usually think of the third act of this movie, which is the government's involved and we're trying to dissect the alien or we're, we're trying to figure out, are, are they a threat? Um, And it's so beautiful and wonderful to instead imagine a first contact experience of a child meeting an alien because that's maybe the only part of humanity that could do it maybe properly, which would be, I just accept you on your own terms. I kind of am curious, just purely curious about you and want to know what's going on with you. I, if you are friendly to me, I'll be friendly to you. I'm not going to be suspicious or worry about the geopolitical consequences of this encounter. And so I think it's damn woke children. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag children are woke. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful idea to take the alien encounter trope. I, you know, high concept and imagine actually what maybe is the most ideal way to make that contact would be, through the eyes of a child who is just empathetic and caring and want, needs a friend. Um, and I think it's just a really interesting thing that Spielberg, I think, has done over and over again. And it'd be interesting to think about, yeah, what are other high concept um, genre ideas that are, would be worth looking at through a different lens, through a different perspective and seeing, yeah, what is sci-fi situation X through the eyes of yeah, a child or some other kind of person that is usually not the person that is involved in that situation in our classic sci-fi tropes. Um, and E.T. is a really cool example of that. Yeah, I was thinking about Arrival while watching this also, just like another. But again, it, it's I feel like it's such a, I love Arrival and there's a lot of emotion in Arrival, but the aesthetic and the approach, again, like is just completely the opposite of E.T. where Arrival is sort of like distant and and still frames and muted and like it's just doesn't have it's a different approach i guess to to mystery but it doesn't feel it doesn't have the childlike wonder and so i feel like just those two compared to each other helped me kind of s- helped shine a light on what was unique about et and that that method of doing a an alien discovery story kind of like you were saying in some ways it's like both films 
style is appropriate to the protagonist right. lens. You know, right. you have you have like an yeah. academic studying the right. aliens in one, and you have a child studying the alien in the, in the other, and the movie's kind of totally the form matches that for sure. And and just wanting to shout out to Melissa Matheson uh, who wrote the screenplay. And writing like this, if you have a child protagonist or even like a child in a, a prominent role, child psychology is kind of required. Like it's important to understand developmental stages and like what's happening in different phases of childhood. Um, because I feel like the portrayal here of uh, Elliot is really well studied. Like I know a little bit about children. I have two. Mine are younger than Elliot is in this movie. But like understanding what's going on at different stages of child development and like where they see themselves, what their brains are literally doing and how connections are made. I talked about how this movie makes intuitive sense. And I feel like what it's doing is directly tapping into the exact sort of developmental stage that Elliot is in, in this where like he has a younger sibling and he has an older sibling and the specific stage that he's in is really different than Gertie's. It's also really different than Michael's, right? Um, and I feel like there's a really strong um, sense of like Elliot's longing to be younger, longing to be older and seen as older and seen as mature and able to handle things. But also he has all this innocence and wonder. And also, yeah, he's like specifically doing this thing where you know, the scene, actually, I was thinking about it this time around with the the old movie. And, like, he kind of clearly has a crush on this girl in his class, uh, the little blonde girl with the pigtails. And I feel like, or sorry, she has a headband. But um, there's something really specific happening there where, like, he's really too young to have gone through pu- puberty yet, right? So he can't actually have, like, romantic or sexual feelings for this girl. But there's, like almost a a role playing that's happening where like he's connecting with her because of the movie and because of like the way that he sees adults interact. And like, again, it's, it feels like it's exactly tuned to where that character is. Um, And I just think that that seems so well researched and observed. And I just feel like, I don't know. I don't see a lot of examples of movies like this that are are quite as good at being like, here's what it's really like to be in third grade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not younger, not older. Third grade, the movie. Something I was just thinking about recently is is I think it's interesting to think about at any given age, especially in in childhood, like how far in either direction can they go? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about like a 14-year-old, maybe or a 13-year-old can like, be smoking cigarettes behind the convenience store with their friends. But then when they get sick and they're throwing up, they're going to go home and like lay in the tub while their mom, you know, put (laughs) dampens their head with a washcloth or whatever. Right. It's kind of like you can, you can go, but if you went too far in either direction, you're like, Oh, that's not right for that age. Right. So it's kind of like exploring. And I think they do that with Elliot at, at obviously a younger age is exploring how sort of dramatic he can be, but also how, adult he can be and and sort of, but always staying within those boundaries at either end yeah also quick aside speaking of symbols the you know putting a frog in a jar to right? dissect it and then the releasing of the frog i mean it, i do have to hand it to spielberg that was pretty nice yeah pretty sure you can see a dead frog in the bottom corner of one of the wide shots <laughs> I'm, I'm sure frogs were harmed in the making they of this definitely movie. trampled on some this frogs. is not a no animals were harmed some animals were for sure harmed here yeah they were all dumped out a window. <laughs> They'll be fine. <laughs> also, did they do that? That was partially what was horrific about it. It was like, each of you gets your own frog and a glass. You get to drop in. Here's the, some chloroform. You chloroform, are going to kill the frog. Right. And watch it go to sleep. Uh, if it's too disturbing, you can look away. If you don't have, like, what? We did this to children? I don't understand. How also, like, its heart might still be beating. I think he says that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, the teacher's dialogue in that scene is obviously just about E.T. Right. Like, where he's just like, if you'll notice the connections between this and that, they are aligned. And the heart might still be beating. It's it's foreshadowing. Yeah. Anyway, Trisha, what's your lesson? My lesson is a bicycle chase. Um, 
Yeah, I don't feel like we've talked enough about the iconic bicycle chase in this movie, and I want to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, And I know I've mentioned before on the podcast at some point about, like, basically how to surprise an audience. And it's not just a setup and payoff, although it is, right? Like, we know E.T. can levitate things. That's shown to us earlier. Not on this scale. So it's an extension of a rule that we're already familiar with. Like, um, and... I'm talking about the initial like bicycle scene where Elliot flies across the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an extension of a rule that we're familiar with, but also there's music and the music does an unbelievable amount of work in this movie. Like truly this time I was really paying attention to it and I was like, Oh no, 40% of the wonder actually is from John mm-hmm. Williams. Like mm-hmm. well and truly. Um, and Every you know, once in a while, it's like Elliot's just like kind of going to school. The music's like, look at this kid. He's going to school. Holy <laughs> shit. He's going to school. And it's like, all right, relax. <laughs> but yes. Oh my God. It's vault to wall. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is so much of it. Um, and it's gorgeous. Like basically every minute of the score isn't, is unbelievable. But again, like this big sweeping orchestral thing uh, set against the backdrop of what's essentially a family drama, um, it's really effectively done. And I guess Hire John Williams can't be my lesson. Um, I guess it could be my lesson. I mean, hurry up. Just- yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is he taking gigs anywhere? <laughs> Yeah, he probably isn't taking gigs. No, he's only 92. He's got Listen, a couple of decades. if Spielberg called him up, he'd do it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I, I I was just noticing it this time around. And, you know, there's that famous uh, cut of, like, the medal ceremony, right, from Star Wars. And um, there's no John Williams, like, mm-hmm. triumphant brass mm-hmm. score underneath of it. And everyone's just standing around. It's all incredibly awkward. And no one's saying anything. Um, that sequence, I was thinking about that this time around with the finale of this movie Mm. and the bicycle scenes, both of them. Um, But it's like, imagine those scenes without this score (laughs) with literally any (laughs) other score, like pick any other score, pick any other composer. It just, it ceases to be the moment that it is. Um, Like the Indiana Jones score might come close, but that's like kind of cheating. Yeah, it is cheating. Um, And I'm not a musician. I would love to hear from musicians about, like, why the exact combination of notes and harmonies and instrumentation of the bicycle theme is what it is. Um, But just that if you're going to have a character soar across the moon um, on a bicycle with their alien best friend, then maybe you should have a theme that matches that amount of wonder. And... They are not easy to come by. And so I just um, was once again swept away by how incredible this is. I think part of what works so well in those sequences is that the full expression of the theme has been held back. Yeah, Uh, I mean, and that's that's operatic technique, right? Like this is very classic, like going back to, you know, classical music. You hint at a theme earlier and then thread it through the movie. And then when we finally hear it in its entirety, it has a big emotional payoff. You're absolutely right. And and, but it's late enough in the movie that conceivably there could have been an earlier place for it. But the fact that it is saved for the bicycle lifting off is part part of why it's so powerful. It's like we we felt this theme, we've heard this theme, but now it's really literally soaring and we're soaring. And so that's why I think it is that magical combination. And I, I was thinking as you were speaking, Trisha, about the ending of the movie, because it it's a very long goodbye. You know, there's a lot of just, this, you know, now ET's up going up the ramp. Now ET's standing in in the backlit thing. Holding. Emotional individual goodbyes with everyone. <laughs> exactly. And so I was just imagining that sequence, you know, in one of those YouTube videos where they just do like Foley <laughs> instead of music. Mm-hmm. Remove all the music. It's just like, yeah. I, I, I want to see that now because that would be such a long, painful scene without just the score swelling over and over again and mm-hmm. like milking you for every emotion. <laughs> yeah, that would be funny. I'm having thoughts about like different fun scenarios that would, like anyway yeah john williams is good i won't go down that rabbit hole john williams (laughs) plus steven spielberg is pretty good 
Yeah, yeah, works works pretty well. Kind of made all of our dropping movies. some knowledge here on Beyond the Screenplay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the hottest take of all time. Yeah. <laughs> Keep coming back for these insights. Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, what else have you guys been watching recently, Alex? What have you been watching recently? So the, the other week, uh, Brian and I went to go see a movie together, and that movie was in IMAX. And the film was called Megalopolis by Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say about it, genuinely. Uh, Brian made a poster for it uh, based on the poster for The Room starring Tommy Wiseau. And I think that, like... Called The Rome. Called The Rome. Because... <laughs> <laughs> It's a uh, allegory for the fall of Rome, I guess, and you know Caesar. Uh, what's his last name? Caesar Catalina. <laughs> Caesar Catalina <laughs> is the name. Is the name of oh, Adam yeah. Driver's character? <gasps> Aubrey no, Plaza's character is, not. is Wow Platinum. <laughs> yeah, um, this movie's insane, but like not in a fun enough way to be worth watching, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Aubrey Plaza, like. Seems to have a lot of fun in her like insane role, uh, but once again, the movie's not fun enough with her to make it worth it. Adam Driver is so Adam Driver, but like not in a way that I want. And it's just it's such a bizarre movie, and I just can't say much more than that except for just yeah, it's there's there's a feeling of uh, swinging for big things like the room does. But like some <laughs> acting and writing that, you know, is swinging the way the room does. <laughs> and it's just really but with 200 times the amount of money, with so much money, but with visual effects that are insanely bad. A lot of times it's just it's really it's a, it's a remarkable artifact. I don't know what to make of it um, with like moments of like extremely earnest messaging about like uh, positive messages but then also mixed in like really strangely like, yeah, g- goofy, misogynistic, weird female characters. Like just don't know what the hell to make of this movie. Uh, and so I, I'll stop talking at this point. But we saw Megalopolis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Which is only 15 minutes longer than E.T. But the, the movies do not feel like similar lengths. I have not checked my watch as often Maybe ever Ooh. in a movie as during yeah. Megalopolis. Wow. I usually do because I'm curious about structure, but then every once in a while I'm like, <laughs> when, when can we not be here? Um, yeah, it's it's weird. I will say some of the response, the sort of apologist response to this movie is like, oh, you didn't get it knows it's a comedy. And it's like, oh, no, the movie very clearly is being goofy and silly and funny a lot of the time. Like that is not a question. Nobody is going to watch this movie thinking – it's trying to be serious the whole time. It's it's really over the top and goofy in a really fun way sometimes. And then, as Alex was saying, it's really sincere sometimes and really trying trying to be earnest. Some sometimes pulling it off, sometimes not. But then there's this whole middle ground where it's like I don't know if I'm supposed to think this movie. We're all laughing, but I don't know if we're supposed to be <laughs> at this scene because it's not it's not earnest enough to be earnest or good enough to be, to, to make me care, but it's also not goofy enough to be goofy. So I don't know yeah. what the hell I'm supposed to be feeling right now. And that was the weirdest part was just, yeah. was, was the not knowing. The whole oh thing's an uncanny Valley where it's, it's like, okay, cool. If this is like a interesting satire, strange fever dream movie, I could get on board with that, but like, it's not funny enough to be funny, but it's, it's kind of trying to be funny, but it's not funny. Anyway, it's it becomes a whole lot of nothing, and it's remarkable. Megalopolis. <laughs> Sounds like we should do a, a season of what we're watching on it and watch Melissa it. Melissa Matheson was in a relationship with Francis Ford Coppola for like a long time. Mm, interesting. And she married Harrison Ford. Better. Wow, nice. Probably. <laughs> Step up. <laughs> um, Francis Ford Coppola. Apocalypse Now crossover. <laughs> Uh, played one of the doctors in the ET scene. Uh, I thought I recognized yeah. that doctor. I thought it was like, that looks like yeah. Francis Ford. I was like, yeah, I was like so that's funny. a director. So I don't know that for sure, but exactly. This is my point. <laughs> I mean, they were, yeah, they were. <laughs> uh, cool. Rude. Trisha, what have you been watching? 
Um, I'm pretty sure I haven't talked to you guys about it, but I saw a movie I really liked called The Taste of Things. I was saying, guys know this movie. Ooh, I can't wait to tell you about it. Um, it's a movie from 2023 starring Juliette Binoche. And it's a period romantic drama where uh, Juliette Binoche plays a chef um, in like 18th century France and uh, in like a huge stone manor house in like rural France. And it's about a romance with her and like the landowner, the lord of the manor, and she's the chef. And uh, but he's also like a gourmand and like very into food. And mostly this movie is just them cooking. And <laughs> I loved it. It's so <laughs> I loved French. every minute of it. it I, the whole first, like, if you are curious but don't want to commit to watching a whole movie, just watch the first like 20 to 30 minutes of it. It's them preparing one meal. For like 20 to 30 minutes, it's all just like dappled sunlight and haze through the windows of the stone kitchen and like beautiful copper pans and just like every single step in real time of preparing like a six course meal. Um, It's gorgeous. I love it so much. It was great. Uh, That's really everything you might need to know about it. If you're into food, Michael, it's not for you. Um, okay, but for how anybody much else, is Jeremy Allen White uh, like grappling with darkness? In it? Is, that, <laughs> is that not a thing? Uh, no amount, but there is a lot of darkness in it. And uh, it's Juliette Binoche. So yeah, anyway, um, I uh, adored it. The Taste of Things. Nice. It was on, on my list for that year and I just never got to it. So definitely re-adding it to my brain. Good. <laughs> nice. Brian, what else has been in your brain that you've been watching? <laughs> well, Michael, this season, as you are watching things that you maybe wouldn't always choose to watch on your own time, uh, just be glad that you didn't watch the Pythonathon, which was how I spent my summer um, watching 13 movies that were either <laughs> the Money Python movies or written or directed by one and starring at least one other. So if you are keeping track of all of our What Am I Watchings at home, get ready, because I watched Monty Python and now for something completely different, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Monty Python's Life of Brian, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, Monty Python Live at the Hollywood Bowl, which has a Glendale reference, Uh, Monty Python Live, parentheses mostly, Uh, the John Cleese written A Fish Called Wanda and Fierce Creatures, the Eric Idle written Splitting Airs. The Terry Gilliam directed Jabberwocky and Brazil and the Terry Jones directed Eric the Viking and absolutely anything. The end. Why? Because I wanted to. (laughs) My partner wanted to. What's the best one? uh, Probably A Fish Called Wanda of all of those. Oh, no, Brazil. Brazil and A Fish Called Wanda, I'd say, are the most. The Monty Python movies are definitely an acquired taste. And even for someone like me who loves them, there is a feeling of just like, okay, there's like. There's just a bunch of skits that are kind of being held thinly together by a plot here. And sometimes they work better than others. Um, So it was it was interesting to watch the the tangential experiments that a lot of these guys have done. Splitting airs with Eric Idle and Rick Moranis is a completely insane movie in Catherine Zeta-Jones. But I watched it a bunch as a kid. So I was really excited to rewatch that. And absolutely anything, which is Simon Pegg as someone who gets like Bruce Almighty powers. Um, And then all of the surviving pythons play the aliens who give him those powers and are deciding whether or not they should destroy the Earth, depending on how he uses them. It's not a good movie, Um, but (laughs) it was fun. And Robin Williams plays the voice of a dog and (laughs) it was his last role. So, yeah, it was it was it was a time and I enjoyed my time. I think the way Brian does these kind of themed movie marathons is the way I like binge like side quests in a video game where it's like I'm not. Am I enjoying these side quests? Do I need to do these side quests? It's but it's satisfying that I checked all the side quests off and I did them all. Right. That's, that's at least how I imagine you, <laughs> you, you do or the satisfaction you're getting from from these uh, tasks. I feel like Bry's just clearing his notifications. Right, right. <laughs> right yes. yeah. Everything has been read. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> you're a very specific kind of person, Brian. I know. You should see my inbox. It's very, it's very small. Fall favorite season. We are all different people. <laughs> we are all different people. Well, I'll keep with that thread. I was going to maybe talk about the penguins. I've started watching, but I only watched the first episode. So I'm going to wait, watch the next couple. It's report good. back in a little bit. And in the meantime, I started rewatching the West Wing. 
And I for I, the how manyth time? I can, I can tell you. I could not tell you the number. More than ten, less than fifty. Um, <laughs> and it's still <laughs> great. Was that a, was that a, a proportional response to her question? <laughs> What's the virtue of a proportional response, Brian? We've already done that episode. So good. Anyways, episode two is post hoc ergo proper hoc. Like this show comes out swinging. Anyway, it's been really fun to revisit. I was pretty worried that it wasn't going to hold up for any number of reasons. And there are definitely certain things that are aging for sure. Uh, But I was impressed by, it made me nostalgic for this era of television and Alex, you and I have talked about this a lot recently, but just like 42 minutes, people are going to watch commercials. You have to keep everything moving and interesting and get cliffhangers in there and hold people's attention, which is the opposite of like, we need you to keep paying us money for two and a half months. So we're going to make this show as slow as possible and prolong the plot unnecessarily, which is like what all the streaming services are doing. So I just love how tight and clever and fun every episode is and the blending of humor and drama and the performances. My God, the performances. Anyway, so I still love the West Wing. Uh, I love how Michael talks like a West Wing character when talking about the West Wing. You can't help but do it. And when you're watching it, it just like you, you get into the rhythm. You just want to keep people saying people's names over and over again and interrupting them and then ending every conversation with a go away. Leave me now. Get away from me, please. <laughs> to say nothing yes. of the phrase to say nothing of. <laughs> Indeed. I start conversations by listing facts now. Anyway. So also the title of the episode you named is like the most West Wing title I've ever heard. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Post-talk. Oh, in the classic, Erica we have Brown. to talk about the, the uh, like, like, oh, what are you having for dinner tonight? <sighs> there was a farmer once who, and then it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, what? <laughs> it's like, why is there a monologue happening right now? And just Toby's dry thing and Josh is just, okay. Like, he just, <laughs> anyway, it's so great. <laughs> so well that's done. what I've been watching. That was not bad at all. Yeah, very I've good. Seen it a lot. You think? Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> it's another one. This has been our conversation about E.T. Michael uh, hijacked my favorite thing to talk about his favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Help it, help everybody. Can't anyway, spell so, West Wing without E.T. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to get out now. So this is the beginning of our fall favorites season. Just the beginning. Uh, <laughs> just the beginning. Uh, we want to say thank you to the patrons, as always, for making this show possible. And if you want to help us make more episodes, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. You get ad-free versions of every episode, and you get access to Patreon-exclusive episodes, like next week's episode on Maholland Drive. <laughs> Season might kill me. Uh, <laughs> thank you to our producer, Vince Major. Thank you to our editor, Mike Worth, and the whole Nebula Studios team. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi, and we will see you in the next episode for our discussion of Mulholland Drive. Bye, everybody. Bon home. Ouch. <laughs>